Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on use of the aspect C and aspect methods for identifying swallowing pathophysiology. My name is Katrina Steele, and I will be moderating this session, and I'm joined by members of my lab team. We'd like to also acknowledge all of the other members of our team at the Steele Swallowing Lab who have contributed to the work that we will be sharing today. Our lab is located at the Kite Research Institute at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute University Health Network. And we also have a few disclosures as shown on this slide, the most important of which is that together with the trainees and staff of my lab, I am the developer of the ASPECT and ASPECT-C methods. So here you can see the agenda for this session. I'll be doing an introduction and then handing off to members of the team. And we're going to take a case study approach to illustrating how you can use the aspect C method in your clinical practice to understand the mechanisms that might be behind impaired swallowing safety and efficiency in your patients. And hopefully that approach to analysis of video fluoroscopy will help you in determining targets for intervention. So to begin, I'd like to ask each of you to think about the situations that are listed on this slide and to decide which of them is an example of something abnormal. We classify things as normal or abnormal all the time, including the examples of height, weight, running speed, temperature, blood sugar, and the number of words that a child puts together in utterances that are all listed on this slide. And all seven of these examples are actually examples of abnormal values. That is values that fall either at the top or the bottom end of the distribution of values that we typically expect for that particular parameter or function. You probably had no difficulty guessing that the first four items on the slide were abnormal. But as we got towards the second half of the list, perhaps you started to feel a little less certain of your reactions. And maybe you wanted to run a quick Google search to check your reaction against some sort of web-based information about what's normal. And this challenge of deciding whether a value is normal or abnormal is also something that we encounter every day in our clinical practice. So let's consider a few more examples, this time related to swallowing function. And here I'm pretty comfortable betting that we would see much greater variation and much less confidence in people's responses. And there are a few reasons for that expected variation. The first is that you may not have the fact about published normal reference values for these different parameters related to swallowing ready at your fingertips. The second is that you're probably aware that there is some degree of variation on these parameters in healthy people. And third, as hinted by some of the conditions that I've described in these scenarios, is the fact that the circumstances or conditions that we use when we make measurements of these parameters may in fact impact the resulting measures themselves. Now, those of you who have taken even a basic introductory course in statistics may remember that there's actually a statistical definition of normal, and that refers to the central 95% of values on a data distribution. And on a bell-shaped curve, which is also called a Gaussian or a normal distribution, this corresponds to the values that fall within two standard deviations on either side of the mean, as shown by the green rectangle on this image. And that means that values that fall outside that green rectangle in the tails of the distribution, which corresponds to the bottom and top 2.5% zones of the distribution, 
and also to more than two standard deviations from the mean and is shown in those red rectangles on the image, these values can actually be legitimately labeled as abnormal. And at least at face value, this offers us the possibility of developing greater confidence in our interpretation of values for quantitative measures of swallowing in our patients, provided that we have access to reference tables that tell us where the values of those two standard deviation boundaries for healthy swallowing lie. But before we go further, there are a couple of issues with adopting that kind of very strict statistical approach. And the first issue is that the labels normal and abnormal are a bit politically loaded. And so we prefer to use less loaded terms and we'll do so for the remainder of the presentation. And those terms are within the reference interval to refer to those statistically normal values and the term extreme values to refer to those values that fall in those 2.5 percent tails at the top and bottom of a distribution. The second issue is that many of the parameters that we're interested in when we're measuring swallowing behavior turn out not to have Gaussian distributions, but they have non-Gaussian or skewed distributions. Residue is a good example here in that we all understand that healthy people should have minimal pharyngeal residue after a swallow. And that means that the most common value we would expect to see on a graph of distribution of residue measures in healthy people would be towards the left-hand side of the graph at the zero end of the scale. And this is what we call a positively skewed distribution like the one illustrated on the image. So for skewed distributions, rather than using means and standard deviations to define the 95% portion of the range of values that are most common, instead we use percentiles. So here, values that are expected in healthy individuals would be values up to the 95th percentile, as shown by the green rectangle again, while the 5% of values at the top end of the distribution in the red triangle zone would be considered extreme. And the third issue that we need to think about is whether or not the boundaries of that reference interval that differentiate the 95% of values that are most common from the 5% that are unusual or extreme are good boundaries for deciding whether or not somebody has a value of concern in a clinical assessment sense. And the answer here is not necessarily. And the reason for considering clinical boundaries that are less stringent as values of potential clinical interest or concern is that values seen in healthy people and values seen in people who genuinely have a condition of concern overlap to some degree. So a good example here would be blood sugar levels. And here we can see a chart listing fasting blood glucose measures in healthy adults in a Scandinavian study. And the 97.5 percentile value or the upper boundary of that healthy reference interval is shown here. And you can see that all of the values above that cutoff boundary are six or higher. It turns out, however, that clinically, the accepted range for clinical concern starts below that value of six at a value of 5.6 millimoles per liter. And this is what's called the clinical decision point for deciding that somebody has pre-diabetes as opposed to having full-blown diabetes. And it's at that less extreme clinical decision point that clinical investigation and interventions would be warranted. So as we apply this to swallowing, there are two major goals. The first is to define the healthy reference interval. And this is work that is ongoing in my lab. And secondly, we want to, over time, gather enough clinical data to more confidently define clinical decision points that differentiate values of concern from values that are of no concern in people who have dysphagia.
Now, when it comes to swallowing, we simply don't have enough data yet to determine where those clinical decision points should lie with any degree of confidence. But we believe that there probably is value in proposing clinical decision points at less extreme points along the distribution, similar to the example I gave of prediabetes. So for the purposes of today's presentation, we're going to use the term typical values to refer to values that fall in the central 50% rather than 95% of the healthy data distribution. And we're going to use the term atypical to refer to values that fall outside that range. And that means either below the 25th percentile or above the 75th percentile. And these are the proposed clinical decision points that we've been working with at the moment in our research. So these atypical ranges include values that are truly extreme, and they also include values that are approaching those tails. Depending on the parameter that we're looking at and whether or not it is a skewed parameter, we may only be interested clinically in one side of the distribution rather than the atypical values on both sides. So our team is working towards these goals. And in 2019, we published a paper in the Journal of Speech-Language Hearing Research reporting preliminary reference values for a large set of quantitative measures of swallowing from video fluoroscopy across the range from thin to extremely thick liquids. And those data were collected in healthy adults, half men and half women, under the age of 60. And in the original publication, we reported those values in the forms of means and standard deviations. And it's important to know that those reference values were collected using a standard video fluoroscopy protocol that is illustrated here on the slide. And more research is definitely needed to confirm whether or not those reference values are generalizable to other contexts. For example, we used a non-cued swallow paradigm, and it's very likely that some of the timing measures that were reported cannot be generalized to the context of cued swallows. This slide shows you the standard operating procedure that we used for video fluoroscopy rating in order to generate those reference values. And we call this method the aspect method or the analysis of swallowing physiology events kinematics, and timing. And we have been continuing to use this protocol to analyze data collected from several different samples of research participants. And if you're interested in that information, I encourage you to watch our other webinar at this convention describing the profiles of swallowing that we see in these different groups. As a result of those comparative studies, we've just recently released new updated reference tables for swallowing measures in healthy adults across the adult lifespan from age 21 to 82. And you can access these tables on our lab website, and you'll see that we've evolved from sharing means and standard deviations to sharing reference values that are now percentile based. So the available information now includes values at P or percentile 2.5, 25, 75, and 97.5. And until we have more data available, we're proposing at the moment that we set clinical decision points at P25 and P75, such that the values of potential clinical relevance are those outside that typical range, which we call the interquartile range, as measured in healthy adults. Now, I'm sure you can imagine, based simply on the complexity of this flowchart, that the full aspect method collects a very large number of parameters, and it takes considerable time and more time than is practical in regular clinical practice. So at the 2019 ASHA convention in Orlando, we introduced the first version of the aspect C method or the aspect method for clinical use. Aspect C is a much shorter method 
And it focuses on parameters that our research suggests are key for explaining the mechanisms behind impairments in swallowing safety or airway protection and swallowing efficiency or bolus clearance. And the method involves determining whether the values seen in a patient fall above or below those clinical decision points at the 25th and 75th percentile values of the healthy reference distribution. And in this webinar today, we're releasing a revised version of the Aspect C method. This version includes the updated reference value tables that I've mentioned for adults aged 21 to 82. And it also includes one additional parameter as a potential mechanism explaining impairments in swallowing safety, and that's pre-swallow residue. And so now I'm going to hand over to another member of my team to take us through the next section of the presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Barrett, and I'm a clinical research coordinator and speech language pathologist in the Steel Swallowing Lab. And I'm going to spend the next half of the presentation applying the concepts Katrina has discussed to real patient cases. Before we jump in, I wanted to quickly summarize some of the top benefits and the why of using the Aspect C method. One, it is a clinically geared quantitative measurement method for video fluoroscopy. It measures swallowing timing in milliseconds and swallowing efficiency as a percentage of the C24 space in reference to your patient. Two, Aspect C is normed on healthy swallowing reference values. Three, the information identifies mechanism of impairment, which is critical for selecting targets for intervention. And four, it is clinically relevant to understand how patient performance differs across consistencies, as opposed to collapsing performance across multiple consistencies in an assessment protocol. While we are releasing updated reference values today, moving from means and standard deviations to percentile-based values, what hasn't changed is how to calculate and measure the Aspect C variables. And if you're unfamiliar with our tool, this webinar from ASHA 2019 is a great place to start for that foundational knowledge. Today, we are hoping to spend our time applying that knowledge to two case studies. After that, we're going to spend the last part of our presentation in Q&A with Katrina to discuss how Aspect C fits within the broader swallowing landscape. Before we get started, I just wanted to draw your attention to our lab website, which contains supporting material, including Aspect C instruction manuals and links to webinars like the one I just discussed, all available for free. As we go through the two case studies, you're going to want to make sure you have the Aspect C worksheet and scoring sheet from our lab's website pulled up or printed out in front of you. This will allow us to score the swallows together. The following patient was referred to us, a young female post ATV crash with focal laryngeal crush injury. She had had multiple laryngeal reconstruction surgeries and had a size four shyly trach in situ, which you'll see on the video. She was taking a diet of regular solids and thin liquids at the time of our referral with some reports of food and liquid inconsistently ejecting from the trach. We took her to fluoro, and these are the consistencies we trialed. We looked at her in the lateral and AP views. What is important to point out here are two things. One, that Aspect C does not assess AP views on fluoro. However, we know that AP views are still important in our patients. Two, that Aspect C does not prescribe a particular bolus protocol. However, that said, there are a few rules of thumb supported by research that we would suggest you consider. An example would be number of task repetitions, where we would suggest you administer up to four sips of thin liquid to rule out a safety impairment, as research suggests that patients who display impaired swallowing safety do not do so on every bolus. I'm going to play a clip on the next slide, and we're going to analyze a bolus step by step using the Aspect C method. With Aspect C, you analyze every liquid consistency you give the patient. This could potentially range from thin to extremely thick on the ITSI pyramid. So if I only give six liquid boluses, then I should have six rows filled out. And we move left to right across the chart in the direction of these arrows, following the logic at the top. Remember, this is a choose your own adventure for each bolus. 
we know that two thin liquid boluses may not act the same. So it's important to analyze each of them while only analyzing the components that are relevant, saving you time as a clinician. Let's dive into our first case. This is an uncued sip of thin liquids. So the first thing is bolus information, the yellow column in front of you. I simply want you to count the number of swallows in this clip. So this bolus was thin and it was the first bolus in our fluoro sequence and there were two swallows. Now we will move on to the next section of the tool, swallowing safety in blue. Aspect C uses a modified eight point pass score. The scale is broken down into two categories of green, typical, and red, atypical. Pass scores of one, two, and four are considered typical because they are reported to occur in healthy swallowing and involve no residual material in the laryngeal vestibule after ejection. Watch the clip again, and this time watch for any penetration or aspiration events on both swallows. This is difficult because this patient doesn't have a traditional laryngeal vestibule in the context of the reconstruction surgeries. So the patient's pass on the first swallow was a three. This is an atypical value. So we go to the next column, laryngeal vestibule closure integrity, also called LVC, to help us understand why the patient has an unsafe swallow and the underlying mechanism of impairment. Let's take a step back from our patient and do a quick refresher on LVC integrity. Complete LVC is defined as a complete seal between the epiglottis and the arytenoids leaving no visible airspace or contrast in the laryngeal vestibule. Let's watch our patient's laryngeal vestibule closure. The patient swallows twice to get this bolus down. Remember, we're always analyzing the first swallow of a bolus in aspect C. Notice there is complete laryngeal vestibule closure. So I would score this as a Y indicating yes to complete closure. So if LVC closure is not the issue, then what else might explain the unsafe swallow we saw? One possible mechanism is the timing of the laryngeal vestibule closure. If we notice penetration aspiration occur before LVC, it suggests that the system is not reacting quickly enough to the incoming bolus. If the penetration aspiration occur after LVC, it is possible that the patient is penetrating or aspirating pharyngeal residue. So based on the flow logic at the top of the worksheet, we continue to the next box, 2D, LVC timing. In our LVC timing column, we measure the time it takes for the LVC to occur from when the hyoid bursts or takes off to when the laryngeal vestibule is the most closed. This parameter is sometimes referred to as laryngeal vestibule closure reaction time in the literature. In our patient's case, hyoid burst happened at frame 111. Next, we look for the frame where the laryngeal vestibule is the most closed. In this case, it's frame 127. So we take the difference between these two numbers, which is 16 frames. We divide 16 frames by the frame rate and times it by 1,000 to convert it to milliseconds. This will give us our LVC timing value of 533 milliseconds. So let's put 533 milliseconds in context. This is where we need our Aspect C scoring sheet. Let's compare our patient's value of 533 milliseconds to our healthy population swallowing thin liquids. There we see that time to LVC should occur in 167 milliseconds or less, indicating a substantial difference our patient's value of 533 milliseconds is atypical and likely a mechanism of impairment. In our tool, we also have included a box to indicate whether there is any residue in the pharynx before the first swallow of the bolus you are analyzing. Research has shown that the presence of pre-swallow residue doubles the risk of penetration or aspiration on subsequent swallows. It is important to note that pre-swallow residue is a less common mechanism for aspiration than 2B, LVC integrity, or 2D, LVC timing. For this reason, we have placed the scoring of pre-swallow residue 
after these more likely mechanistic explanations. In our patient's case, as you can see on the slide, we don't see pre-swallow residue. So we would write N on our worksheet. Our last step is to look at 2F, pass evolution. When a patient swallows multiple times on the same bolus, there may be multiple pass scores. Maybe the first swallow has a score of two and the second swallow of that same bolus has a score of three. We want to capture this worsening on our tool if it occurs. Let's look at our patient's case. She swallows twice on this bolus. The first pass score is a three. The second pass score is a one. Because her pass score does not get worse, we would write NA or not applicable. Finally, let's look at the third and last section of the Aspect C tool, swallowing efficiency. You'll see it in peach on your worksheet. This section looks at the question, is there anything left in the vollecula, piriform sinuses, and or anywhere in the pharynx at the end of the first swallow of a bolus? Watch the clip again and ask yourself, is there residue after the first swallow when the pharynx is most relaxed on what we would call the swallow rest frame? Here, the answer is yes. We see residue in the piriforms. So the next question is, is that residue amount typical or atypical? Is it greater than 1.7% of the C2 Ford squared space or not? And I can hear Emily, where did you pull 1.7% from? So if you take a look at the scoring sheet in front of you, you'll see that anything less than 1.7% for thin liquids is considered typical under total pharyngeal residue. And you'll notice the number changes by consistency. So the next logical question that follows is how do I know what 1.7% of the C24 squared space looks like on fluoro? And the answer is you don't, and neither do we. We actually know from the data that even experienced raters such as those that work in our lab and trace residue all day long, struggle at guessing and putting residue amounts from lateral floral images into ordinal boxes, even when those boxes are generous, like the 25% increments on the Eisenhuber scale. This paper is a summary of those results if you're interested, based on a review of over 3,500 boluses. Long story short, we suggest you trace residue, even if it's a small amount. Not only will you then know with greater certainty whether it falls below or above the threshold, but it will also allow you to compare this number moving forward should your patient have a repeat video fluoroscopy. So let's go back to our patient. So I open my image J, a free downloadable software. I measure my anterior inferior corner of C2 to my anterior inferior corner of C4 with my line tool, and I trace my residue. This gives me 0.3%, which is less than 1.7. So her residue is considered typical. Because her residue is considered typical, as per the inbuilt logic on our worksheet, we can skip 3B, as the patient does not present with a swallow efficiency concern on this bolus. 3B, pharyngeal area at maximum pharyngeal constriction, may explain the mechanism of impaired swallow efficiency in patients with atypical residue values and we will explore how to calculate this in our next patient case. So this is what my completed worksheet looks like for one bolus. So we would go through that process for each of our patients' IDSI drink boluses until we have a completed worksheet. Then we transcribe our patient's worst value per parameter per consistency to the scoring sheet. That means if there are three thin liquid boluses, we would want the worst pass, the worst LVC integrity score, the worst time to LVC score, and they may not all come from the same bolus, but they will all come from the same consistency. Then I've compared the top, my patient values, to the bottom, aspect C, typical reference values. You can see I've color-coded my results so you can quickly tell what's going on. Those in red fell under atypical and green fell under typical. You can see moderately thick is completely black and NA all the way across here. That means I didn't test that consistency on this video fluoroscopy. You might also notice I've documented a pass of eight here, not a pass of three like we saw in our clip. But remember, we are choosing the worst value per parameter per consistency. 
Because an eight was observed on a different trial of thin liquids in this patient, this is what gets carried forward. So some of the key findings for this patient that aspect C allowed us to elucidate were, there was complete laryngeal vestibule closure. However, this was occurring too slowly as compared to data from healthy individuals, resulting in instances of penetration and aspiration before the swallow. Because we knew the mechanism of impairment, we tried a bolus hold with this patient and it eliminated instances of penetration and aspiration with thin liquids. We also noticed that while the patient has piriform sinus residue, the amount is typical when compared to healthy reference values. Finally, we noticed the patient has an atypical number of swallows, but this was not related to pharyngeal residue. This patient actually had esophageal involvement and the atypical number of swallows or piecemeal swallow strategy we observed may have been a compensatory response. So I can hear clinicians asking, where do we put all the other information? What about the solids we tried? Or the AP view we completed? Or the compensatory strategies and their effects? We've added a parking lot at the bottom of the scoring sheet, so you can put all of that great information striated by ITSI level in one spot to consider at the end and work into your impression statement. So we've done the analysis and compared our patient's values to our reference values. But how do I document my aspect C results super fast because I have 10 other patients to see today? When we see these patients for fluoro and we do aspect C with them, we find charting our results in a table followed by an impression statement to be concise and clear and allow for easy comparison in subsequent reports. It's important to note that aspect C does not spit out recommendations regarding diet texture or consistency, and nor should it. Only you with all the clinical knowledge that you've gathered about your patient can make those recommendations. So just to circle back, in this patient's case, we were able to start with an uncued cup sip of thin liquids. This patient was drinking thin liquids at home. But what if clinically you had a patient who was NPO and you thought that starting with a teaspoon of thin liquids was what was most clinically indicated? Can you use aspect C to analyze a teaspoon volume or what if you try to cup sit mildly thick liquids? The patient had significant issues with residue. You coach an effortful swallow. Can you use the aspect C to analyze the effortful swallow and compare it to the unaided aspect C mildly thick values you've collected? Those are great clinical questions. Sit on them for now. We're going to move on to a second case study example, but I promise Katrina will answer these at the end in our Q&A section. Okay, let's jump into our second case study. 80-year-old gentleman, previously independent with no prior history of dysphagia, contracted COVID-19 and required ICU admission. He was intubated and put on a ventilator for a total of 23 days. To further complicate matters, he had a left MCA stroke during his stay in hospital. As a result, he had significant oropharyngeal dysphagia leaving him NPO and receiving all his nutrition and hydration through a gastrostomy tube. We conducted a video fluoroscopy and used the aspect C method to analyze it. Let's review a bolus of pureed solids he trialed and go through our aspect C analysis logic together. Watch the clip first. Let's fast forward through scoring this time, moving left to right on our worksheet. In this clip, he's swallowing a teaspoon of pureed solids. It's the eighth bolus this participant has trialed on our fluoro exam. He swallows four times. The pass on the first swallow in the clip is a pass of one. And as a result, we skip forward to 2F pass evolution. On subswallows of this bolus, you can see swallowing safety actually worsens and the patient scores a pass of three. And with that completed, we move on to swallowing efficiency, the third section in aspect C, colored in peach on your worksheet, specifically 3A total pharyngeal residue. It is clear with this patient, swallowing efficiency is a huge concern. Let's assess the extent of that impairment and try to understand potential mechanism. 
We see residue in the piriforms, the vollecula, and other areas such as the base of tongue. As previously discussed, we use image J to trace the residue as shown here in yellow. I measure the anterior inferior corner of C2 to C4 with my line tool, plug the values into calculation on our worksheet, and that gives me 14.2%, which is more than the typical reference value of 1.5%, which we can find on our scoring sheet. I wonder if some might be thinking, well, it would be easy to tell that the residue fills more than 1.5% of the C24 squared space just by looking at it. However, I would push back and say there are still several reasons to measure. In this patient's case, we actually went on and performed 12 weeks of dysphagia treatment. Even post-treatment, this patient still had a lot of residue. And in such a case, having numbers pre and post-treatment makes post-hoc comparisons really easy and also removes any bias we have as clinicians performing post-treatment exams where we are often hoping our patients will improve. So back to our patient. Knowing his total pharyngeal residue was atypical at 14.2%, we want to look at 3B, pharyngeal area at maximum pharyngeal constriction, to understand if it was a potential contributing mechanism. This is defined as the area of unobliterated visible airspace and or bolus at the height of the swallow. Again, we are measuring this on the first swallow in the sequence, not the second or third subswallow. And again, we are normalizing this to your patient's anatomy with the C24 scalar. Here, pharyngeal area at maximum constriction is traced in blue. Based on our calculations, this gives me 18.2%. A normal reference value for this parameter on puree boluses is less than 1.4%, so our patient is considered atypical. This suggests a contributor to impaired swallow efficiency in our patient is reduced pharyngeal constriction. So this is what my completed worksheet looks like for our patient's puree bolus. Again, we would go through this process for all our other drink boluses, ranging from thin to extremely thick or pureed, it's C level four. Looking at all my drink boluses, I would transfer the worst value per parameter per consistency to my scoring sheet. Then I'm comparing my patient values to the healthy reference values below, making the atypical typical distinction. And as you can see, I've highlighted in red the areas of concern. But what if you had a patient with a clear or pharyngeal dysphagia but aspect C didn't reveal the mechanism of impairment after following the logic. If that occurs, the next step would be to take a look at the full aspect method. The full aspect method has more parameters than aspect C, but we don't recommend it as an initial clinical analysis tool because of its inherent complexity. Our team has begun applying the full aspect method to a variety of patient populations to see which constellations of impairments tell the story in a given disease process. For example, our lab's analysis of stable COPD patients revealed that aspiration was not common in this group. However, they presented with significantly reduced UES opening duration and poor pharyngeal constriction, which may be predictors of pharyngeal residue. They also presented with short LVC duration, which represents a potential risk to aspirating residue. If you're interested in learning more about aspect profiles in Parkinson's disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke, as compared to healthy aging, watch our other pre-recorded session at the ASHA convention. So this is the end of our planned presentation. And usually if we were all together, we'd open it up for questions. And so we've put together a list of questions for Katrina. So Katrina, I think a great place to start out because you're both an ITSE board member and have led the creation of Aspect C. How would you suggest a clinician evaluate the food side of the ITSE pyramid using Aspect C in video fluoroscopy? Thanks, Emily. This is a great question. So ultimately, we do hope to establish reference standards for the food levels of the ITSE pyramid as well. And we have begun some pilot work in this area, but there are at least two big challenges. And the first is to recognize that video fluoroscopy really isn't the ideal examination for 
exhaustively exploring differences in swallowing across different food items or textures, partly because it does not provide a good view of oral processing. And secondly, because mixing food with barium is strictly off label and against barium manufacturer instructions. So unlike with barium liquids, where there are standard stimuli available and we're typically only mixing powder with water. With foods, we don't have similar access to standard barium stimuli. And second, research suggests that there's a huge amount of variability in healthy adults in chewing behaviors, and also that standardizing the ingredients in solid food stimuli is important when you're going to measure chewing and oral processing behaviors. So it's not good enough to say that you tested using a cracker. Uh, and this has come out of the work of the Thomas development by the Huckabee Lab. Um, and they've shown that the brand and name of the cracker needs to be reported. Not all crackers behave the same way. So there's really a lot of work to do here. It's a future aspiration of ours to get there. Uh, but I think it will take time. That's great. Thanks so much. I wanted to talk a little bit more about how you chose these reference boundaries, because I wonder if there's a risk if we go by the 25th, um, 75th percentiles for a potential over-identification of issues in patients. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Thanks. This is also a really important question. And it's important for me to start by sharing openly that my own understanding of what we call clinical decision points, these thresholds, has been evolving based on reading and learning that I've been doing regarding the way that these thresholds are established in laboratory medicine for blood tests. And the simple truth is that right now we don't have enough evidence to know exactly where to place the lines between values of no concern and values of potential concern. And there are risks in both directions. So if we set the limits too far toward the extreme ends of the distribution, we risk under detecting values of concern. Or as you've suggested in your question, if we set the limits too close to the middle of the distribution, we risk over detecting problems where there really is no basis for concern. The 25th and 75th percentiles are simply starting points. And I think that clinicians should certainly pay attention to values that fall in the proposed atypical ranges, but should interpret those values in the larger clinical context. So if a person presents with atypical values and they show signs of penetration, aspiration, and residue, then addressing those specific parameters that have atypical values would be warranted. And I also think that there should be increased concern when a person shows multiple atypical values as opposed to only one. However, if a person shows one or two atypical parameters in the absence of any functional problems, so no unsafe or inefficient swallowing, then I would be less likely to consider those values as clinically concerning. This is sort of like the analogy of a tree falling in a forest when nobody is there to hear or see it falling, and that existential question about whether or not the event was real. And in the swallowing case, it's possible that you or I or other healthy people might have some values in these atypical ranges, but we would never know unless we went looking for them. And unless they occur in the context of symptoms or functional concerns, then they probably are not sufficient to warrant any clinical concern or intervention. Thank you. That's great. I love that tree in the forest analogy. <laughs> so next question, you had a great slide at the beginning of the presentation outlining some of the stipulations on which the aspect data was collected. So things like non cued swallows, 30 frames per second. But for our colleagues in the U.S., many use 40% Verabar in the fluoro suite. You use 20% EasyPake in your original reference values paper. 
Do the aspect C norms still apply to a site using Verabar? And what differences does product or concentration make to quantitative measures? Yes, so thanks for pointing this out. This is actually a research question that we hope to directly explore and answer in the next couple of years uh, in collaboration with our colleagues who have access to Verabar because it's not currently approved for clinical use in Canada. Our current expectations are that 40% weight to volume Verabar is more likely to leave a small amount of coating on the pharyngeal mucosa than 20% weight to volume easy take. So this means that the reference values for typical residue may shift a bit. We also do know already that different barium products contain different ingredients other than barium, such as suspension agents and ingredients that limit foaming. So there's some work to do here to properly understand the consequences of those differences in, in ingredient lists. This is sort of like the cracker issue I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, based on some work we've already done, looking at some different 20% and 40% weight to volume concentration barium products, unfortunately not including Verabar, my current expectation is that beyond the potential residue difference, the impact of these differences will be small and probably not big enough to cross those boundaries between typical and atypical values. That's great. Thanks so much. So I want to push this even a little further. As a clinician, we know that patients are complicated. And sometimes you can start with a cup sip, but sometimes it needs to be a teaspoon maybe. Or sometimes a clinician might suggest uh, some compensatory maneuvers be used. Does aspect C and its measures still apply in those two particular scenarios? Thanks. So I think the two things to say here. The first is that if you want to generate a report that says on this parameter, the patient tests with typical or atypical values compared to the aspect reference measures, Ideally, that comparison would be done without compensations and using the same setup that we've described. However, if you're looking at a patient who is employing some sort of compensation, maybe spontaneously, or maybe you start as a clinician with a more conservative volume, then I think you can still calculate the measures. And you, the question you should ask yourself is if the patient shows an atypical value in the context of a compensation, then I think you can conclude that they would also be likely to show that atypical value without that compensation. And so you can be relatively confident in concluding that they do show atypical values on that parameter. Uh, I think an example here, just to illustrate is some recent work about hyoid position. We know that as we get older, our cervical spines compress and get shorter. And over the last few years, we've been encouraging people to do spine referenced measures of hyoid position. And you could predict on that basis that as we get older, the spine denominator would be smaller. So hyoid peak position in older people should be larger than it is in younger people. And so if you went in knowing that and you saw reduced hyoid peak position in an older person, you can be confident that it really is reduced because it should be even bigger than the 75th percentile threshold that we've established. Great. So a difference in the aspect C method is the inbuilt logic in the analysis process. So if you see X, then you do Y. Would there ever be a time you would bypass that inbuilt logic and complete all the calculations? An example would be a patient who's newly diagnosed, let's say with ALS and is very early in their disease process. You take them to fluoro, there's no penetration or aspiration events. Would it be clinically relevant to calculate things like time to LVC in a patient so that you can track it over time? Thanks. So a uh, couple of thoughts. Um, the first is to be cautious 
that the aspect C or indeed the aspect method as we've described is not actually likely to be sensitive to subtle differences, right? We're looking at changes in the context of variation seen in healthy people and those changes are going to need to be pretty big to jump out as different. Uh, but I do definitely think that there are clinical circumstances like the one you've described where a more comprehensive exploration of a person's swallowing physiology using the full aspect method would be of value. Over time, I do hope we will identify biomarkers or specific parameters in the aspect method that are the ones that are most likely to reveal these signs of early disease or disease progression. Thank you so much. So I want to talk a little bit more about the newest parameter that's been added to the aspect C methodology called pre-swallow residue. I think many of us as clinicians know to examine residue post-swallow on video fluoroscopy, but don't necessarily think to do it as systematically pre-swallow. Um, so why do you think pre-swallow residue is something clinicians need to pay more attention to on their patient's video fluoroscopy based on your work? Thanks. This is another question that really taps into the learning that I've done over the past few years myself. You may remember that Sonia Malfinter and I previously published a paper where we looked at residue at the end of an initial swallow and tried to determine whether there was a critical volume or threshold amount of residue that would predict penetration aspiration on the next swallow of that same bolus. So here we were looking either at clearing swallows where there's no new material added from the mouth or piecemeal swallows, including the residue and new material added from the mouth. But as our group has continued to look at this residue as a prediction of aspiration question, uh, we've discovered a few things. First, we've discovered that the majority of these secondary or tertiary swallows are piecemeal, not clearing. So the context is usually of adding new material on top of residue in the pharynx. We also realized that it's really a false assumption that most of us bring to our assessments that the pharynx is clean and empty of material at the beginning of every new bolus in our assessments. Uh, so hopefully that is true for the very first bolus in your protocol. Although the people who do these exams would probably remind us that there could be pooled secretions that we are not taking into account on video fluoroscopy. But after that first bolus, all bets are really off. From that point forward, there is a probability that the pharynx is contaminated already by at least some residue from previous boluses and swallows. And that's what we're calling pre-swallow residue the material that is already visible in the pharynx at the beginning of a new bolus or a new swallow. And our 2020 paper that looked at this showed that whenever that pre-swallow residue measures more than 1% of the C2 to C4 squared reference area, the risk of penetration aspiration on the next swallow doubles. So far, most of our work looking at predictors of penetration aspiration has looked at single predictors in isolation, perhaps reduced peak hyoid position or incomplete LBC, or as in our 2020 paper, pre-swallow residue. And as we move forward, it's going to be important to combine those predictors into models, explore multiple questions together, to see which ones really are explaining the mechanisms underlying airway invasion. Thank you so much, Katrina. So this concludes our presentation entitled How to Use Aspect C and Aspect Methods to Identify Swallowing Pathophysiology. I want to thank Katrina and our co-authors, Melanie Pallido pigeon Hanata Mancox, and Vanessa Paines. And I want to encourage everyone listening to continue the conversation with us. Reach out on social media, 
reach out on our Twitter, reach out to us through email, ask us questions. We love engaging in this type of dialogue. And just because we can't be together in person this year doesn't mean we want the conversations to stop. Enjoy the rest of your ASHA conference.